One of the difficulties that arises when we try to understand human maladaptation in the modern environment is a general, in my opinion, false approach to understanding what human beings are. In fact, we're starting right now with using the term human being as opposed to human animal. And oftentimes, if you bring up the term human animal, it's met with opposition. It's often met with a list or an enumeration of qualities and attributes that human beings have that supposedly distinguish us from other creatures, other animals. But I would argue that everything in the animal kingdom, including that what which uh, composes or comprises humans, is graded on a continuum. It's a question of degree. So we say human beings are intelligent, or we have a uniquely developed neocortex. Well, that's a question of degree. Compared to what? Human beings have a certain quality of vision compared to what? So it's all a question of degree. It's, there's nothing particularly unique about hum, human beings. It's, it's just the quality and the extent to which we've developed in a certain direction. But when we talk about modern maladaptation, and I'll be making references to an older video of mine shortly, it's very difficult to understand because I believe a lot of maladaptation is hidden. It occurs at a psychological subconscious level. But before we move to that area, I want to talk about some of the past things I'd mentioned with regards to maladaptation. Now, many, many winters ago, in the olden days, I produced a video titled Fisheri and Runaway, and I'll be posting a link to that old video. But I talked essentially about the Irish elk, uh, for which the most commonly posited uh, cause of extinction was a number of factors. One, a destruction of the habitat, that is, a uh, lack of vegetation it could feed off of. And this led then to a problem, particularly for the males, that grew these massive, massive antlers. And the requirement for these antlers, among other things, was a great deal of calcium. And oftentimes it could be drawn from the nutrition. With a lack of nutrition to draw from, and something that continually went on, apparently, was that the Irish elk drew upon its own calcium reserves in its bones. But with the lack of nutrition from the soil, this caused a problem and kind of led to, uh, well, its own demise, ultimately. This is, generally speaking, the most commonly accepted theory. We can understand, in this context, the great Irish elk had a very specific environment. It had uh, very specific physiology, the males in particular, massive antlers, which required large deposits of calcium, which couldn't be met by nutrition alone, and they had to essentially engage in uh, cannibalism in its own body. But when the nutritional resources were, were no longer present, what you get is even more cannibalism, which eventually leads to extinction and other problems. It seems to be a fairly clear-cut case, even if we don't know definitively that's what happened. But we can definitely identify an environment, a certain type of food that it required, as well as its own physiological requirements. In addition, there are other things that we can understand about animals. Uh, you, many of you are familiar with the term invasive species. Uh, simply put, an invasive species is a species of animal that has been introduced into a new environment that it did not evolve in, which is to say it's not actually part of the native ecology. The fact that a native species is then not part of the native ecology often means, or almost always means, that it will have harmful effects on the native ecology that it has been introduced into, sometimes disastrous effects. Now, in, in this context, I want to talk about two specific species that have had disastrous effects in their respective environments. Many Australians will be familiar with the uh, species uh, sometimes referred to as uh, the cane toad. Now, the cane toad, which uh, is scientifically referred to as Bufo marina, so I think Rinilla, Rinilla marina, is actually a native of Central and, and South America. It actually has no place in Australia. But human beings, being the not-so-smart animals we sometimes think we are, uh, decided to introduce them in uh, the earlier 20th century. What happened was uh, sugar cane farmers had issues with so-called uh, cane beetles, and these beetles are actually native to Australia, 
and they thought it would be a good idea to introduce a predator because these beetles tend to have a, a thick uh, exterior exoskeleton, a heavy exoskeleton, and the eggs and the, and the larvae tend to be deep below ground. So, you know, what, what do you do? You introduce a predator that can consume them. And they thought, well, cane toad, great idea. So in 1935, the uh, Bureau of Sugar um, Experiment Stations, and I think it's called Sugar Research Australia now, if I recall right, uh, introduced the cane toad in small numbers. And uh, this is 1935, I think about 100 were introduced into northern Queensland. That's uh, in the northeast, for those of you not familiar with Australia, it tends to be a hot humid air area of Australia. Uh, similar to the environment that the cane toad comes from in South and Central America, not too dissimilar. 102, and we fast forward to the present, and uh, the 2014, uh, I think those last bit of data I can have, and there'll be references and links in the low bar, we're talking about over 200 million cane toads. Um, they, they're they well, they've reached the border of New South Wales, and as you can see in the picture, um, that is their current, this was in 2008, mind you, they're probably, they've expanded even further. The projected uh, expansion probably will take place in the next couple of years. They're everywhere. And the problem with the cane toad in Australia is that it, it's an invasive species. What does this mean for the uh, native ecology, for the native animals? Well, most of the animals aren't familiar with it. So many animals try to prey on it, uh, birds in particular, but other species as well, and they have an issue. Because cane toads, like many uh, amphibians, have so-called paratoid glands. And these paratoid glands produce a toxin which can be fatal to animals and even can cause burning and discomfort in humans. So not exactly a pleasant animal, quite big as well. They, can, uh, they average about two kilos in weight, so it's a big frog, or rather a big toad. And they're a pest, and they're impossible to get rid of. I mean, they're so omnipresent in Australia these days that uh, native Australians, probably males in Queensland and parts of New South Wales, uh, ritually partake in so-called cane toad, toad clubbing with a golf club. They're just a pest. They have no place in Australia. And the wisdom of the, the uh, Bureau of Sugar Experiment Stations uh, has uh, led to disastrous results, disastrous results for the animals that are native in Australia. Some animals, uh, such as certain bird species, have figured out certain things about them. Well, for example, that if you flip them around, you can, you can eat them or attack them without getting hit by the paratoid glands. And there are even some species, native species, apparently the Australian meat ant, that are immune to the, essentially the, the poison that's emitted, the toxins that are emitted. But it, it, it's destroying the environment. It's been a huge disaster. Another species, before I get on to the, what I'm actually talking about, the crux of the matter, uh, far away in Africa, is the Nile perch. The Nile perch was introduced to Lake Victoria in the 1950s and then more extensively in the 1960s. The Nile perch is, as is implied, native to the Nile River and areas around there. Lake Victoria is, a, is the largest lake in freshwater lake in Africa. It used to be a, a place of incredible biological, uh, well, biodiversity and ecological diversity in general. And when they introduced the Nile perch, it had a disastrous effect. Now, the Nile perch is a massive fish, and it basically outcompeted all the native species, and to this day, there's basically nothing left. Make a long story short, it's gotten to the point where the Nile perch routinely engages in cannibalism because there's just nothing left in the lake, really. So it a bigger Nile perch purchase will feed on other Nile perches and so on and so forth. Total, total unmitigated disaster. People weren't thinking as usual. So... But it's very clear what's going on in both the case of the cane toad and the Nile perch. Uh, these are species which have characteristics that are not native uh, to the environments they've been introduced to. And as a consequence, the vast majority, if not all of the species in some cases, in the case of Lake Victoria, which borders on Uganda and Kenya, uh, they're just, they weren't prepared for such a massive fish that could outcompete them in that environment. Uh, Lake Victoria is landlocked. It evolved over millions of years in a very certain uh, certain context, environmental context, and the life was fairly unique there. The biodiversity was fairly unique there. And of course, in Australia, there are some species that have sort of lucked out, like the meat ant and various bird species, but by and large, the cane toad is a disaster and a pest. 
And this is because most species on the planet evolve in a very distinctive environment. And if you remove them from one environment to another, they'll either die or thrive and flourish at the cost of the thriving and flourishing of other species, which is to say, sure, the cane toad is doing very well in Australia, particularly in the Queensland environment. It has that hot uh, subtropical, or indeed parts and parts tropical environment that it was native to, but uh, the, the other species in Australia are not benefiting as a consequence. And the Nile perch initially did very well in Lake Victoria, but it, it absolutely destroyed the fishing industry there and for human beings as well and destroyed the native species. And it's very clear. It was really big. The cane to toad has certain adaptations. It's big. It has paratoid glands. None of the native species were really prepared for this. When we come to humans, though, it's not very clear because other species of animals tend to be singularly adapted to a certain environment, you know, cane toad, subtropical, tropical environments. I mean, if you were to throw the cane toad into the northwestern territories of Canada, it would die pretty quickly. One can almost assume that. Um, likewise, most freshwater water fish don't do particularly well in salt water. If you threw the Nile perch out in the middle of the Indian Ocean, it wouldn't do well either. So there are very specific adaptations all, almost all animals have, and you take them out of that environment, they're not going to do particularly well. Uh, you can see this in the subspecies of tigers. The Siberian tiger, tiger uh, which is almost extinct by now, has a much thicker coat of fur than its cousins, the Bengal tiger uh, and the, the almost extinct Sumatran tiger, as well as other former subspecies that are now extinct. There are specific adaptations. If you were to take a Sumatran tiger and throw it into in northeastern uh, Russia, where the, the remainder of the Siberian tiger exists, well, it probably wouldn't do nearly as well because it would freeze to death. So animals, other animals, uh, it's very clear. Uh, look at whales. It's very clear how they evolve. They're meant to be in the water. And, of course, human beings aren't meant to be in the water. That's pretty clear, too. However, the thing about human beings is we're... In incredibly flexible. Yes, there are distinctions between ethnicities and, and races. For example, sub-Saharan Africans tend to uh, store fat more below uh, the gut line and the buttocks and the legs, and this makes sense in that context. And people of European origin tend to store fat along, well, above, above the gut line because it protects the inner organs against cold. And so, yeah, we have some adaptations and almost certainly the shape of East Asian eyes is an adaptation to the climate as well. But by and large, by and large, human beings are incredibly adaptive and flexible in where they go. So you can be a you know an East African and move to Finland or or Iceland, and you put a coat on and you'll be fine. And at least in theory, you can be a European and go to the hot, stinking forests of Central Africa and be okay as well, though I probably wouldn't like that very much. We're very flexible. And so what, what's apparently very evident about certain species like the cane toad invasion in, in Australia or the Nile perch invasion in the Victoria, Lake Victoria is that, okay, clearly different species. Look at the way they look. Look at their properties. It, it's just a disaster. We look at human beings and we don't see the, these massive uh, environmental upheavals by uh, removing, say, human beings from one place to another. We, at least we don't think of it in that context. We don't think, well, human beings aren't native to this environment because human beings have colonized every, every continent, save Antarctica, for whatever reason. I'm sure we could if we wanted to. Instead, we look at human beings outside of the animal kingdom. We think, well, you know, an invasive species is one thing that applies to animals, lower life forms, but not human beings. But I propose to you that similar things apply to human beings. What... For example, different forms of government and government growth and, and different demographics. Th these, these are essentially, on a human level, the same issues that are faced in an ecological uh, context with regards to certain species of animals. We don't look at it that way, but in terms of government structure and how people react to it, it's pretty much the same thing. So, so much of human maladaptation takes place at the psychological, subconscious level, very rarely is it a question of pure physiological maladaptations uh, 
such as we saw in the now extinct Irish elk or the plague of cane toads or uh, Nile perch in Lake Victoria. It's those, it's just a very clear instance. And humans were sort of deceived by the fact that, well, you know, we're pretty much the same, more or less. We don't have massive physiological differences compared to other species, and we're incredibly mobile. We live pretty much everywhere in, on the Earth except Antarctica. And so it takes a little bit more effort uh, with human beings. We have to be able to identify that there are also psychological maladaptations that affect us. And many of these maladaptations have been well documented on YouTube and the, say, the MGTOW community, the way divorce works in an urban environment. Most recently, Coltan produced a series of videos, some very ex most recent video, excellent video, on not so much incentives to get divorced, but incentives to get married in the first place. And hopefully we'll have a talk on that soon. But this all occurs on a psychological level. This isn't a question of we're in a new environment and we weren't poorly adapted or we're so well adapted that we're destroying all the other species, although we do that too, but that's for other reasons. It's not a question of just physiological adaptation so much as other things in that case. Human beings are deceptively difficult, deceptively difficult to understand, but we need to take human beings under the same microscope that we do, say, the cane toad or the Nile perch. We need to look at the structure of government uh, urban versus rural environment as as essentially ecological environments that human beings interact in and to see what effects those ecological environments have. So a shift, for example, from agrarian culture to urban culture, right? Or the differences between the way women act in an urban environment versus a rural environment where they have limited access to resources and indeed limited choice in terms of mates, in terms of men. All of these things are very important, but most of us don't spend very much time thinking about it, number one, and thinking about human beings in the context of being animals responding to a certain environment. That's all we are. We lucked out in terms of brain development. We're smarter than many animals, but we're not that different. And so long term, we can definitely see similar disastrous results uh, to ourselves by ignoring what we've become and what we are in our own ecology. The ecology of 2015 is largely in the West, an ecology of big governments, lots of spending, um, an overabundance of technology and resources, and it, masquer it disguises everything, and it, it masquerades under a veneer of civilization and human beings being so advanced as we allegedly are, uh, being perfectly well suited to that. That's not how we evolved. We evolved in small, close-knit tribes eking out a, a pretty m miserable existence uh, in, in previous times. And it's almost, well, we can almost certainly assume that the current environment is one that we will not react to optimally. That is to say, our instincts that guide us and for example, uh, C.S. MGTOW put an excellent video, excellent video on male disposability in the context of war in the case of a civilizational breakdown. Even in the modern environment, we don't need to look at men as disposable because well, we have all these resources and so on and so forth. But what do we have instead? We have feminism, we have a lack of homeless shelters, we have a lack of support for male, uh, male-specific diseases and so on and so forth. We carry with us all the properties and qualities that we brought, uh, brought for, that were brought from our ancestral environment to the modern environment, but we don't think of it ever in those contexts. So it's it's absolutely essential that we take human beings under the microscope, and indeed take the human animal under the microscope. We need to look at ourselves as cane toads. We're very different from cane toads, obviously, but we need to look at ourselves and the impact we have on the environment, because believe it or not, civilization is an ecology. And ecologies can change with the introduction of new species. And in the context of humans, the introduction of, say, new legislation and other things that can have a massive effect on human beings, uh, re how human beings react and interact with that environment. This is something that I think we've done to a decent extent in MGTOW, but all the bullshit that we see with feminism and anti-feminism and all of this stuff this came about 
by not regarding the human beings as an animal that evolve in a certain context with a certain quality and a certain mindset. And we didn't think about how people would react. We just pushed forward. And to be frank, it's the kind, same kind of lack of insight and stupidity that led Australians to introduce the cane toad in 1935 and idiots to introduce the Nile perch to Lake Victoria in the 1950s, which has destroyed the lake's ecology and even the local fishing uh, industry, which is pretty much non-existent these days compared to the olden days. We need to, when we move forward as a species, think about ourselves in the context of ecology and being an animal in that ecology. If we, if we don't, we're doomed to repeat the same mistakes over and over and over. It's just that simple. So I hope uh, you got the gist of what I was saying. In summary, we have very clear physiological attributes in the case of specific animals, which we tend to miss in human beings because we're more or less the same. But then we don't think about the psychological maladaptations that come with new inventions and new developments and movements in civilization. We need to think of human civilization as an ecology and human beings' place in it. Maybe, just maybe, we could solve some of these issues if we did it that way. All right. Anyway, thanks for listening, and uh, I'll check you guys out later. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Take care. Bye-bye.